Hey, what's up, squad? From Reach Suite, I am Colin Smith, and welcome to the Cold Ones Podcast. It's a podcast with chilly questions and even colder ice cream. And today, we are joined by my dear friend, Mr. Mike Berger. You know him as the former VP of Product Marketing at ClickUp, Marketo, SurveyMonkey, Gainsight, you name it. He has helped launch some of the most iconic brands in B2B business software. And you also know him as your favorite San Francisco-based sailing fanatic. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks, Colin. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. It's my pleasure. I'm actually really, really excited for this conversation because every time you and I get on a call together, we just goof off and have too much fun. And I, <laughs> I expect that's how today's going to go, too. There you go. Did you bring your ice cream? I got, I got the ice cream. Let's see it. I've got, I've got, you sent me a healthy alternative. <laughs> I brought my non-healthy alternative. Um, and so I tell everyone, Mike, we have strategically selected this ice cream for you. All right. We don't just send you some random crap. We pick it for you. This is personalized, I, personalized marketing. This is personalized. A-B-I. Account oh. ice cream. I love it. I love it. So, <laughs> so it, worked, it worked. I'm doing it, right? Yeah, exactly. I know you're like, you're writing down in your cheat journal, like, Yasu, <laughs> ice cream. So I'll pick this one for you because you and I were hanging out in D.C. and we were talking about breakfast. And I was like super stoked that I switched over to doing these like oat-based oat like yogurt parfaits. You're like, well, what kind of yogurt are you using? And I was like, I think it's like a uh, a Yoplait, uh, like Greek yogurt. And you're like. I basically back. told you you're, you're killing yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? You it's like pure sugar, right? You inspired me, though. I switched to Fage or Fage. I think it's yep. F-A-G-E. I, I, I'll butcher it. Yep. It was, so when I saw the Yasso, uh, which I also don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but I saw the Yasso uh, Greek yogurt ice cream bars or Greek yogurt bars, I was like, that's for Mike. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't call it health food, but it's not bad. It's not bad. I think it's like 12, 12 grams of sugar. Maybe it was a little less. So. Oh geez, my ice cream standards. That's pretty. That's pretty good. That's, that's pretty eleven good. too many, Mike. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, man. I really did. I'm sorry. <laughs> For you, I'll I'll do it. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> all right. Well, the first part of the conversation is all about rapid fire, personal rapid fire. Yeah. We jump in. We get to know who is Mike Berger. Who's the guy behind the success, the career, the LinkedIn? Right. So many people know who you are and definitely respect what you've been able to accomplish, but don't know really who you are. You gonna jump in? All right, I'm gonna take one one bite after I ask the question. All right, go for it. By the way, you picked the right flavor. This is my favorite flavor, mint chocolate chip. Did I tell you that, or is it just no. that's random? That's random. No, total mint chocolate chip guy. Oh my gosh, I am two for two. I got on with um, uh, a gentleman uh, a few weeks ago, and he was like, "Did I tell you this is my favorite flavor of ice cream?" I was like, "No." But yeah, butter pecan is my favorite flavor. You have a skill. You should join the circus. Yeah, I should go get a a, a lottery ticket. Um, yeah. All right, first question. A deep one. Hmm. What causes Mike Berger anxiety? Um, well, I think the as it relates to life, I mean, there are a lot, lots of stresses in life. But I think as it relates to career, I think one thing that, that causes anxiety is the fear of, of doing bad work, essentially. Like, you know, when, whenever I create work, you know, whether it's, you know, messaging, positioning or pitch deck, I think it's almost like an artist, I guess, is, is the way, you know, an artist is always super self-conscious about like they'll, they'll, they'll draw something or they'll paint something and they almost don't want to share it with people right? because they, they might be a little bit of a, afraid of what people might think. Um, and I, I think with, with the work that I do, I, I kind of feel that like I, I put a lot of pressure on myself, you know, to create work that I think other people will appreciate and think of as being high quality and compelling. And so there's always that, you know, stress because it, it's, it's not easy to get there. Right. It's oh. like, I think there are a lot of people that just whip something like that up and say, it's good enough. And, the, and like, it's more about volume for them. For, for me, I, I could never really work that way. Like it's, I put a lot of pressure on myself to create something that I think not only I think is great, but that I think others will think is great. And that can be stressful. That can be stressful. Put that kind of pressure, pressure on yourself. It's not it's non-quantitative, right? Mm -hmm. so no, yeah. Like I think, <clears throat> I think in one sense, having an extremely metric driven job, like a sales leader, where it's good and there's bad is really stressful because 
Like it's quite literally either you hit this or you don't and it's bad. That's kind of minor. But on the flip side, right, having a, a more qualitative, less quantitative role, mm -hmm. like the art and the art and science, but art behind positioning and a pitch deck and messaging uh, matrix and, and packaging, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um I'd imagine the downside of that is there's no real end. There's no real breather because it could always be refined, right? There's no end. Well, there's also, you could argue, not not much of a breather for, you know, for sales reps. <laughs> it's like every every quarter of their world, like, starts over again. But yeah. I think you, you create something in, in, on the product marketing side, you can validate it. So, you know, there, there is a way to quantify, you know, whether it, it's potentially going to work or not through testing. But still, when you unleash it, you know, to the world, that's when you really will know. And up front, you, you're first, you're going to get the opinion of others. Like some people can be like, it's great. Others may be like, I don't think this is the right message or the right thing. Um, but over time, you're certainly going to learn whether or not it's working. Now, it's a little bit different because it's often indirect. Like if, if new messaging and positioning is going to work, like let's say the company just takes off. It, it may be 10 things, right? That sort of prompted that growth, new messaging and positioning could be one of those 10 things. So it's really hard to make a very direct correlation, but certainly, you know, you, you can get a sense of whether or not something's working or not once it's out in the wild. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. Fair enough. Fair enough. I guess you can A-B test. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, beach or mountains? Well, I would, um, I'm not a beach person. I love water. I love, I love water. I like, like, you know, uh, I took up sailing during COVID. That was something that my wife and I thought would be fun to learn to do during COVID. So I've been sailing and I've always loved boating in the water. Um, but we just came back from Patagonia. So I have strong recency bias here where it was an absolutely epic trip, you know, like just beautiful, beautiful mountains. Um, Patagonia is, is just such an amazing place. So I would say beach or mountains, I would say mountains with the caveat that water is probably my, my number one. Man, it's so beautiful that uh, it's named after the jackets. I mean, wait. I, <laughs> <All right. laughs> it, I had to work the joke in somewhere. Good for you. I saw some of your pictures there. Tremendous, man. I've, I've never been. Um, where is it? Is it in, it's in South America? Part of, it, part of it's in Chile, part of it's in Argentina. Yeah. Um, and so we we were mostly on the Chilean side, and then we um, we ended up going to Argentina. There's um, a, a Calafat. I think I don't forget if it's pronounced Calafat or Calafate. I think it's Calafat, but it's the third largest glacier in the world. So we we crossed the border, went there, and then we ended up in uh, Buenos Aires at the tail end of the trip, which was which was pretty pretty cool as well. I was going to so, ask if you made it there. How was the city? How was the experience? Very yeah, great city. Very European. Um, very inexpensive. I had like a 25 minute Uber ride was three bucks, which was crazy. We ate at a, a Michelin star restaurant. You know, my wife and I, we actually were there with a group, 16 people. So it was eight couples and, uh, we ate at a Michelin star restaurant. It was for my wife and I, including wine. It was like 80 bucks. That's yeah. So, so coming back to, you know, San Francisco, you know, is, is a, is a, is a shock to the system after hey. experience. For a few weeks. I, your son's on the east coast no one's saying that y'all have to stay man when is Sarah's could be calling the name yeah yeah possibly <laughs> last um last question uh most recent purchase over 250 dollars basically every single piece of gear that i bought for patagonia <laughs> could qualify there yeah yeah think, uh, you know like my hiking boots my uh, jackets a couple of, but one, one jacket in particular i went to rei and uh, and I was looking for a mid layer, you know, so like you, you buy a, a base layer and then you buy an outer shell and, and then there's a mid layer. And uh, there was one from Arcteryx called the Atom. And I, I really didn't want to spend that. I think it was like 350 or 300 or something like that. Yeah. yeah. I was really looking to spend maybe, you know, like 150 to 200. <clears throat> and so the, the guy's like, yeah, you should try it on. I'm like, no, nah, I don't want to, you know, spend that much. He's like, yeah, just try it on. Oh, <laughs> so he got gotcha. you. I, I tried it on and this thing like fit like a, an absolute glove and it was it kind of felt like you were wearing air but it was cozy it was hard to describe and i'm like oh yes i need this and i came home and i i said to my wife i said this thing is so comfortable i said i 
you need to bury me in this. Like when it's my time to go, like I want to be in this Arcteryx jacket, you know? So it was, uh, it was a tactile experience. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like a skin. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, it was a good jacket. Shout out Arcteryx. I'm going to write that down. Arcteryx Adam. Adam, I think. Yeah. Adam jacket. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll have to check that out. Um, all right. All right. Thank you for the personal rapid fire. That was uh, that was fun. That was good. Um, and then we're going to transition to phase two. Phase two is all about professional. Now, I just found out live, friends, that the second ice cream is not delivered. So we do not technically have the second ice cream here with us. So it's well, I can actually speak and, you know, I can. <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair, I don't know if you would have liked the second ice cream because it's very, it's probably way worse than the Yasso. Uh, but I did. I did get you the salt, uh, the salted caramel uh, Talenti because I do know how much you and your wife love sailing. And while I've never been sailing, it doesn't take a sailing expert to know it's probably pretty salty. So it is I, got pretty salty. I got that for you, man. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, I've never, it's crazy. I grew up in Virginia Beach. We did a lot of boating, a lot of jet skiing, never been sailing. Well, come to the Bay. I'm, we'll take you. Yeah. Have you been to, have you, have you sailed in Annapolis? I know it's a big sailing spot. Mm -hmm. No, but I know it's really popular. Yeah. Yeah, I want to. I feel like Annapolis is the the nearest city on the East Coast to where I grew up, where it had a big sailing culture. Yeah, there's a big boat show there, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll, 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 next time I get, yeah, I'll, I'll go there and I'll visit you and I'll visit my son. Dude, you. On that order, I'll go visit my son. For, yeah, son, me and you and go to Annapolis. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, first question I want to talk a little bit about Gainsight. Uh, obviously Gainsight, very iconic brand, huge category creator in the customer success space. I think, I don't know if it's Nick Meta or it's probably, it's all of you, all, all the team that helped build the Gainsight brand in many ways, pioneered customer success as a freaking functional area, right? Um, I don't even know where to start with this, this conversation, but I think category creation is something that few folks get the opportunity to be a part of. Uh, what were some things that you and your team did early on to yeah. pioneer this customer success function? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, in all fairness, I mean, they were they were well along that journey when, when I when I got there. I think, you know, I was a big part of the company, kind of expanding the the, the vision of of customer success and what customer success was, kind of really changing the positioning of customer success from you know, that of a function to that of sort of the mission of, of the entire company and, and everyone that touched the customer. So it was a big part of that journey and a big part of the journey to go multi-product. Um, but, you know, the, the the people who are, I mean, Nick, Nick is really kind of the, the driving force behind, you know, the success of, of Gainsight and um, and category creation. And I think, you know, Anthony Canada was was the CMO, uh, you know, there um, and and was a very strong partner of Nick's and and sort of bringing that all to life. Um, but I think you know what I would say about category creation is like every everybody wants to do it. Like it's amazing how many how many founders you talk to and you know they're like, oh, well, we're gonna we're gonna create a category. We want to create a category, and uh, I don't think they realize just how hard that is to do, right? I mean, it, it's super difficult to do. Um, it takes a lot of time and a lot of money, you know, to do it. And I think, you know, the way I look at it is you need one of two things, or actually you need two, two things together to happen, really. You need a, a technology that's truly, truly different, like truly different, right? I mean, I see a lot of founders, and um, you know, that have a, a solution that, is sort of a an updated version of something else or a modern take on something else. And that you're just not going to create a category around that. It's got to be really, really different. And then you need to have an audience that cares about it, that feels like they need it, you know? Yeah. And uh, and so what, what I think Gainsight did really uniquely is that they, they, they did it hard, the hard way, right? I mean, you, there are a lot of companies that have, that have created, you know, technology solutions that were super innovative and, and different that an existing audience felt like, wow, we really need this. Right. And so 
so that that certainly happens. But they did it the hard way. They 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 certainly had a unique product, but it was, you know, it it wasn't a thing that were really a lot of people wanted. Yeah. Because there, there weren't a lot of people in customer success to want it. You know, it was. Yeah. Yeah. So they they the ones, there weren't even many CSMs to 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 identify no. with the CSM tool. No, in in their their first pulse, there was uh, it was back in 2013. There were there were 300 attendees, and they estimated that. There were only 500 people in customer success, period. The TAM um, was 500 people. Yeah. So one, one, one could question the wisdom of building a product for that. But, you know, they, they essentially built up the audience, which yeah. is crazy. They, they, built, they built up the function. So, so let me ask you, while, while the category is very much in, in swing of being created while you joined, you did do something that I think is extremely unique and powerful. And it's you helped transition customer success from a job title on a requisition to a, a philosoph- like a philosophical belief and alignment that a, a company adheres to. Right. How, how does one transition? First off, getting anyone to do anything, getting my sister to not step, you know, on you know, me while she's walking across is difficult. Getting getting your dog to do how do you get a whole group of CEOs to buy in to this? Yeah. That is just beyond me how you accomplish well, that. Well by the way, it's not like a, a light switch was flipped and suddenly they all they all thought that in fact like they, they still don't, right? So I think that's the that's the thing like one one takeaway I think you know from a conversation like this is that you know how, how do you even define the success of a, of a category. Like, like how do you define when a, when a category is actually created? Probably one way is, Hey, did, did Forrester or Gartner create a magic button or a wave right around it? Right. Because they're only going to do that if buyers are coming to them and wanting, wanting one. Right. And so the first, even though that it's funny because Gainsight is the poster child of category creation in a lot of ways, yet it wasn't until last year, that Forrester created the very first wave for customer success platforms and Gartner still hasn't done it. So think about that, right? Is like, I think Nick joined the company in, I think 2000, I think, I think it was 2013. I think the company was founded in 2009. And so it took 10 years, right? Yeah. It gets to the point where even a, you know, a, a, a major tier one like analyst firm created a major research report around it, right? But I think the way, that you do it, it, it's, it's, there's no silver bullet, right? It takes time and a lot of thought leadership, right? Yeah, a lot of so thought leadership. A lot, 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 lot of leadership. influence. Yeah. And so the way we, we kind of, you know, position it, and this is something that, that I was heavily involved in is, well, we, we had kind of an interesting take um, on it that, you know, like in, in the old world, I mean, we position it as the old world. We know it's still the world we live in, but in, in the old world, it, you know, sales and marketing, you know, kind of were the, the primary kind of growth levers in a company. They, they were the, the functions really driving revenue and growth. Um, and Gainsight really operated um, in, in subscription-based businesses, right? SaaS. Yeah. That was their, their, their target. Um, always hope that it expanded well beyond into other subscription-based businesses, but but still it's it's more of, you know, it, it's very focused on SaaS in, in terms of the base. So when you look at the subscription, you know, kind of, or, or you call it the subscription era or whatever, in a subscription-based business, you know, kind of like the company needs to continue to deliver value. Yeah. Otherwise that revenue just goes away yeah, and, and it needs to continue to deliver value and more of it in order for you know a company to grow yeah. the business, right? And so if you think about the functions all of a sudden that come into play, especially in enterprise software, because in enterprise software it's not just about throwing technology over the fence and you figure it out and make it work. No, that's why customer success exists because there's there's people, process, and technology, and the technology is just one piece of it, right? Yeah. And then you've also got a big trend around sort of the consumerization of technology and, and the, the very different expectations that, you know, users today have around technology. You know, yeah. people still put up with horrible enterprise experience, you know, software experiences way back when now the, the expectations are sky high. So 
where I'm going with this is if you think about in this in the subscription era, what functions are responsible for driving growth? Sure, sales and marketing is still clearly a big part of it, yeah. but product becomes much more important, right? Especially yeah. if it's a PLG company. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you're having a poor product experience, probably, and you know, you know this, right? Yeah. The second is is um uh, customer success, obviously, right? Because they're the ones bringing people and process into the mix. Um, and then, you know, uh, there's, um, I think, well, those, those are the two, two really big ones. Right. And so that was where we went with the messaging is, and, oh, and there's account and then account management, right. right? Cause they're, they're not going to be able to expand, right. Unless, unless they're getting, they're having success and, and getting value. Let me, Mike, let me double click into that thought leadership yeah. <laughs> kind of strategy. What were y'all doing? Obviously 10 years, you know, what I think of when I think about category creation, a lot of times is my old days in medical device, because inherently in medical device uh, and in, multi, in, in pharmaceuticals, typically as well in biotech, uh, you aren't becoming a product if there was another product because the IP barrier is so high. So you are inherently a new product in a new category and you do have to create a category. I mean, that's pretty much like every single pharmaceutical company. They're just masters of creating demand, creating you know awareness and demand, and then creating that category. But it takes 17 years, right? The average uh, um, time to uh, um, market, or not time to market, time to becoming a medically accepted standard is 17 years. It's insane, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's, that's only, I mean, that's 1.8 times what Nick Med has done, which it's even longer. What were y'all doing though in the first 10 years to create thought leadership? What kind of campaigns, what kind of tactics, what were y'all thinking about? Well, I think, you know, I mean, tons of things, right? I think one of one of them was is again, like this, the, the target was really subscription-based businesses. So really touting the importance of net retention rate. Mm -hmm. You know, and and the you know, the the different ingredients that come into play in terms of driving net retention. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure that you remember like in software and SaaS for a long time, everything was about, you know, acquisition, new logos, right? Yeah. New revenue, right? Then all of a sudden SaaS, a lot of SaaS companies grew up, right? And their customer bases got larger. And suddenly like companies were, were, were thinking, oh, wow, like we have a sizable base. We, we probably need to think about like nurturing that, protecting that um, and growing that. Yeah. And so there was, a, there was a lot of thought leadership around like, the, the importance of, of retention and, and net retention a, as a metric and and a lot of thought leadership around all the ways that companies can drive net retention yeah and this is where the the story around like bringing other teams into the fold right came into play we also um, created a maturity model that helped companies sort of understand you know, where they were today and where by using gainsight and bringing in all the the best practices mm -hmm. um, around customer success. Again, not not the function, but more holistically, how they could help them get from, you know, where they were today to ultimately, you know, um, higher levels of maturity. And then the most important thing they, they did around that was the, you know, captured metrics, some some key metrics, including net retention rate for each stage of, of the curve. And so there was a, it, be, it became a very compelling, you know, business reason to want to move up that maturity curve and so there's a lot of thought leadership around how Gainsight could help companies do that. Those are just a couple of examples. Did y'all like lobby the venture capitalists? No. Okay. I, I don't know. I just feel like because VCs have become so focused on NRR and NDR. Well, I think I think you know there there was there was certainly a large focus on net retention rate, right? From yeah. the perspective of a VC and, and its portfolio companies. So yeah, I mean, there, there was there was a I would say there was strong partnership between yeah. us to, between Gainsight and and a lot of the VCs because they re realized that that was the lifeblood of of the companies they were investing in, but it was more of a natural thing. We didn't necessarily lobby. I mean, we tried to develop partnerships. So if, if trying to develop partnerships is lobbying, sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's what I'm just saying. Yeah. Um. Yeah, because it just feels like it. You know, you've made it when the investors that are giving. Your your ICP target audience money is telling them to go look yeah. into, right? Um, what yeah, do you want? I mean, it's a, back to what I said before. It's kind of like a way for a VC to secure their investment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What would you rather? With the time we have left, would you rather talk about highest converting campaigns 
what are the difference between a prosumer PLG product versus an enterprise and what's the pros and cons for people? Probably the, uh, probably the latter. I think you okay. can't be so kind of tactical. And okay. Yeah. yeah. So like, you've, you've, you've <laughs> held leadership roles at obviously Gainside, which talked about very enterprise heavy, very enterprise heavy software, but you also held leadership roles at ClickUp, which is a very prosumer. I have a ClickUp account. My mom is a ClickUp account. I'm walking through the airport and it says the app to replace them all. I know ClickUp, right? I know ClickUp like I know uh, Instagram. It's so it's so embedded in the direct, the prosumer, direct consumer for business professionals. Um, for a lot of folks in our audience, they're probably considering PLG as an as a revenue channel that they want to go work in or or they're considering switching to enterprise. A lot of people think grass is greener on the other side. Enlighten us a little bit. What's the pros and the cons to consider on both sides as as a as a revenue leader, as a marketing leader such as yourself? Yeah, I mean, at, at the surface level, I mean, a pro of the en enterprise sort of model. And and obviously you can be a PLG a company selling it to enterprise, but but I'll say like in terms of a traditional sales assisted, you know, kind of yeah, heavy enterprise sales market motion. Um, you know, obviously, typically that leads to much larger deals, right? Um, so you yeah. can sign up far fewer customers, um, but they're much bigger customers. And you know, if it's an enterprise solution that's very you know kind of tied into people and process those those enterprise solutions can be super, super sticky, right? Um, so th those are some of the benefits. But but I think on the PLG side, you know, you have the benefit of you, if you have the right product that's built to deliver very, very, you know, kind of immediate value, then you, you, you have the advantage of um, a lower, you know, kind of cost of sale. You can acquire customers much more uh, cost effectively um, and, and efficiently. And then you have the advantage of velocity, especially if there's some virality involved, you know, like a great PLG product is one that people can get their hands on very easily and get value very quickly. So they tell other people and, and suddenly like, you know, you, you see that start to accelerate so you can get some great velocity. So it can be a really efficient model. Yeah. Um, so they each have their, 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 their sort of benefits. I think, you know, moving from one to, to another can be, can be really tricky. Yeah. What, what would you say are some, what makes, what makes it tricky? What are some challenges? What are some things that like you're like sitting in an enterprise heavy sales motion? You're like, gosh, I, I wish that I was in a lighter weight and things when you're maybe sitting in a lighter weight PLG motion, you're like, gosh, I'd go back to this. Like, what are some things that you, you people should know about? Well, first of all, I think most companies should make sure that they they really kind of fine tune their their go to market motion, whichever one that they've they've decided on. Um, before they start just building another one, I, I think I think a lot of cases they say, "Oh, like we need to grow, so let's just let's yeah. just hire a bunch of reps or or whatever." And I I don't know that that's necessarily the the right approach. It, maybe in some cases it, it can be, but generally speaking, maybe not. Um, I think it comes down to a couple of things. First of all, people shouldn't underestimate how how deep like the DNA of a company goes, right, and how 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 sort of strong that comes into play for something like this. Like if you've, if you built a PLG business, like everyone in the business that's grown up with the business, they're probably, you know, much more oriented around like how a growth marketing team, as an example, works versus, a, you know, a marketing team in a, in a more traditional like sales assisted model works. Yeah. Um, product thinks very differently. Um, sure. it's just, there's Everything. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a different DNA for, for sure. Um, and I think the other one that's probably more important is, is the product. So yeah. think about from a product perspective, it's it's really simple. If I've if I've built a an enterprise product, take Gainsight as an example, right? You there's a lot of setup and configuration that's needed. You you need to yeah. bring in a lot of data from lots of different systems so that you have that 360 degree view of the customer. You, there's you, there's a lot of like energy and effort that needs to be put into it. You, you get a strong ROI on the other end of that, but it doesn't just sort of set itself up, right? So yeah. imagine moving to PLG, like that you're, you're expecting someone to just sign up and suddenly bring that in. You've also got to orient on all the, the people and process part of it, right? I mean, if it's customer success, you, you have all these ways of operating, these best practices that you want to bring into play and, and the teams to do it. So you yeah. can't just sort of like throw it over. So it would be really hard for someone to get very, very, you know, kind of fast time to value with a product like 
gain site for in a PLG motion. And then on the flip side, you build a PLG product that someone get you know value in, in potentially minutes, right? And and you, you do that by making it really easy to use, right? Easy to use, easy to access, easy to get value. And so you have a if you have a large enterprise with all sorts of you know sophisticated needs around security and and custom configuration and what have you, um, integrations and on and on and on, you probably haven't really built the product for that. So, you know, yeah. like, yeah, you can go and hire a bunch of reps to sell it, but it's going to be a journey. It's going to be a journey getting that product to the point where enterprises are going to find that it's going to meet their requirements. Not yeah. to mention that sales team that's used to, you know, it, especially if, if it's a team that you've kind of built and it, it usually like a, a, a PLG company, they start with, hiring reps to handle smaller deals, you know, because they don't go from like this chunk of the market all of a sudden, like, you know, to right. selling the largest corporation in the world. So that too can be really, really challenging to sell, you know, know, sell that into enterprise. So it's just a, it, they're just two very, very different games. And there are some companies that are doing it pretty well. I think ClickUp is one that's, it's taken a while, but yeah. they're, you know, a lot of learning and, and, and they never gave up on their, their PLG like roots. Like yeah. they, they know how important that is. So they've had some starts and stops on the enterprise side, but I think they've, they've been thoughtful about it to build the capability into the product, you know, before they just decided, let's just hire a, a ton of people and go sell this into the largest companies in the world. Let's, let's actually make sure that the products there. And, and, and now, now it is, but it was a, is a journey. So companies yeah. need to be ready for that, that journey. Right, right. I was just talking to um, uh, the CEO of Payrix, Adam Tizan, about how people forget about the full buyer journey that must be considered when you move up market. Yeah. It's not just promoting some sales reps and teaching them how to sell into an enterprise. It's the implementation. It's the customer success. It's the product. It's the security. It's the cybersecurity positioning, right? There's oh, yeah. so much that goes into it. So your point, I, I totally agree. All right. Um, last question. Success is a team sport. And you've worked on some great teams, some very successful teams. When you think about the support roles, whether it be ABM managers, demand gen folks, marketing operations, rev ops, some of the more ancillary folks that aren't always in the limelight that have had an outsized impact on, on your career and your success, who comes to mind? Do you want to shout out and say thank you? I know there's a lot, by the way. I'll give you the out here. There's probably hundreds. But if you could just think of three people off the top of your head. Oh, gosh. Um, that's, that's a good one. Uh, let's see. Well, I think for me, um, you know, when you think about product marketing, you're either going to have like a really strong relationship with, in a PLG company, it's probably product, you know, in a, in a sales sort of led uh, company, it's probably sales, but lots of people. So I'll like some shout outs on, on the product side. I had a really strong uh, partner um, who led product management at, at Marketo, uh, Cheryl Chavez. So shout out to her. She, she was great partner in crime. Um, I think, um, you know, on, uh, on the marketing side, I had, I, I was, I mean, Marketo was a great place to work, especially as a marketer. Yeah. So much marketing talent. So, um, you know, I worked directly for uh, Sanjay Dalakia um, and uh, Shandar Padabiram and, and both, both amazing marketing leaders that I, I learned a ton from. Um, so I, I would give those guys uh, a shout out for sure. Nick Mehta at Gainsight um, learned so much um about just people centric leadership i i i've like i've always kind of felt that way and and you know that's my dna but yeah. it's so rare to see ceos and leaders in his position um operation operationalizing it like like he has in gainsight so um really yeah just a a lot of um a lot of uh you know kind of um yeah, yeah he's every, great, great memories, um, you know, wor working there. And uh, he, he and I would go back. I'm, I'm a big Patriots fan. And he, he absolutely hates, hates, hates the Patriots. He's a Steelers fan. So yeah. that was always, that was always fun. Uh, I appreciate his, his good naturedness about, about that. So I think. Um, well, that's maybe, three. You don't have to brag, man. Let's just more people you want to shout that out. That was actually four. Colin. That's four. Oh, yeah. There's two folks uh, in Marketo Marketing. Yeah, well, I'm only thinking about it because now I'm, I'm probably forgetting. Like, you know how like you forget the obvious. Yeah, yeah. I probably forgot the obvious one. Uh, so I don't know. Like, if I if you're the obvious one, and I forgot. I apologize. <laughs> there you go. Sorry. There you go. Well, Mike, you made it through. No brain freezes. 
Congratulations. Thank you for giving us some of your time, man. Thanks for making the time for the Cold Ones podcast. Tell the audience what's going on in your neck of the woods over the next year and uh, what can they expect from you? Well, I think, you know, ho hopefully, you know, more, more uh, epic adventures, you know, more, more trips, um, more, more, more sailing. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously right, right now, you know, I, I kind of moved into the, the consultancy side of, of the house and uh, got a really great partner. Um, actually, I should do a shout out to Kevin, right? So Kevin Wu is, is, is my partner in crime on the consulting business. And that's been, um, it's been just a ton of fun and uh, so interesting to jump into different challenges. It's like you, you're presented with different puzzles. And so solving one you know, puzzle after the next has been really fulfilling. So I'm, I'm just doubling down on that and really kind of leaning in on, on that and making that successful. Um, and we've had a good run so far. So that's kind of what I'm up to. There you go. Harmonic messaging. Uh, if you need some positioning help, some pitch deck help, some overall messaging matrix help, go to the guy who helped build Marketo Gain site and click up. We'll help you, you tell a great, great story. Help you cut through all this crazy noise in the market today. Yeah. No doubt. Well, thank you, Mike, as always. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Colin.